wait until the end of the talk to ask questions. And then um, what I ask you is please use the chat to indicate to me that you want to ask a question because then it's easier for me to moderate uh, yeah, the questions. So the speaker of today is Sean Couch, who works on simulations of Calculab Supernovae. Uh, he did his PhD 2010 at the University of Texas at Austin. And after this, he was a Hubble Fellow at the University of Chicago until 2014. Then he was at Caltech, where he was a senior postdoc. And since 2015, he's an assistant professor at MSU. And today, he will tell us about simulations of supernovae and their massive star progenitors in 3D. All right. Thank you, Ingo. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining online and in here in the room. Um, can you hear me OK out there? It's a bit quiet, maybe. OK. Let me move the better. Yes. Yeah. yeah, OK. So we'll go from there. Um, all right. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, supernovae and big stars today and doing it all in 3D. And I'm going to try to connect this, since this is an MA2 GINA uh, online seminar. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about things like the nuclear equation of state today, but I don't have any results, per se, um, on that. But I will try to make connections there where appropriate. This is an important part of the core collapse supernova theory. All right, so why do we care? I think everybody on the genus seminar knows what a supernova is, but why should we care about understanding the theoretical process? Well, it's the end state of all stars above about eight to 10 solar masses, we think. So if we wanna understand stellar evolution, we ought to understand supernovae and why stars blow up. They're the progenitor systems for things like neutron stars and black holes, pulsars, magnetars, they're connected to long gamma ray bursts. We know this observationally, and that hints at some connection between the mechanism that drives supernovae and long gamma ray bursts. Uh, they're obviously very important for nucleosynthesis. Um, we are stargets, right? By mass, our body is 65% oxygen, and that came almost entirely from massive core collapse supernovae. Um, so if we want to understand what we're made of and where it came from, we've got to understand the core collapse supernova process and its nucleosynthetic signature. They provide feedback in galaxies, feedback for star formation. They're very important in understanding structure formation, galaxy formation, star formation uh, as a means of feedback. They make dust. That's important for op uh, observational astronomy. They're very bright. We might be able to see them in high redshift, and so that's important for observational cosmology. Uh, they're multi-messenger signals, right? They emit neutrinos and gravitational waves. So if we are lucky enough to have one go off in our galaxy, we ought to be able to see it in many different windows neutrinos, gravitational waves, and uh, optical. And they're nuclear physics laboratories. They have matter at extreme densities in isospin. Um, and so they're interesting from a nuclear physics perspective. The thing is, our theory is incomplete because we don't understand exactly how these things turn themselves inside out. We understand the process that leads a star to collapse at the end of its life, um, but how that collapse is halted, turned around, and caused uh, to turn into a very energetic explosion uh, which we observe in nature all the time, is still an open question, one we've been wrestling with for half a century. So like I said, matter at extreme densities and isospins and temperatures, they produce most of the elements in nature beyond hydrogen and helium. Um, and a theoretical study of supernovae is complementary to experimental efforts at places like NSCL and FRIB and many other experimental facilities around the world. Um, they're important for neutrino and gravitational wave experiments. We might detect a supernova in these two uh, methods of detection if one went off in the galaxy. And you might even be able to use supernovae to test things like beyond standard model physics of neutrinos. So they're really cool. We know some things from observation uh, about supernovae, which we hope can help us constrain our theory of the explosion mechanism. We know that roughly five per second go off somewhere in the observable universe, five per second. We see more than one of these per day. I mean, we're pushing 10 a day. Um, it's getting, uh, the detection rate of supernovae is going up and that's only gonna increase with large um, optical surveys that are coming online in the near future like LSST. Um, just in raw numbers, that's four times as many as type 1a supernovae, which are thermonuclear explosions of white dwarfs. Um, we tend to observe more of that type of explosion because it's just brighter on average than core collapse supernovae. Um, but there are more core collapse supernovae than thermonuclear supernovae. We know from observations they have large kinetic energies, 10 to the 51 erg, sometimes called a beta in honor of Hans Beta. We know that they have massive star progenitors, and we know this from direct observation. We have seen stars blow up and disappear. A great example of this is supernova 1987A, which went off in 1987. 
um, we actually had archival images of the blue supergiant star in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, and then it blew up as 87A, the light from 87A dimmed, and the star was gone. And of course, now we see a, a, a newborn supernova remnant there expanding. Um, so we've now done this same sort of thing for about 40 or 50 different supernovae, where we have archival images of the star that blew up, and then after the supernova faded, it was gone. So we know that they have massive star progenitors. We know that their remnants, the neutron stars and black holes they leave behind, have large spatial kicks that had to come from the explosion, upward of 1,000 kilometers a second. This couldn't have come from anything except the kind of energies and momenta that you get in the explosion process. So something in the explosion was asymmetric enough to give these things a kick across the sky. We know they radiate neutrinos. The reason we know that also is 1987A, because we detected neutrinos from 1987A, about 24 of them, which was a huge signal, right? We know that they're fundamentally 3D from several different lines of observational evidence. So real supernovae are three-dimensional. We know this for distant sources in other galaxies from their polarization. So polarization measurements look at the photosphere, basically, of the emitting object, and if it's spherically symmetric, the net polarization is zero. All those polarization vectors cancel out. But if there's asymmetry of the emitting surface, there will be a net polarization. Every core collapse supernovae that we observe and measure the polarimetry for is polarized to some extent, some extremely so. So they are asymmetric. Um, we can look at nearby remnants like Cassiopeia A, which is pictured here, and we see that this is not spherically symmetric. There is complex structure uh, that breaks spherical symmetry, and we can dig into this and look at the elements in something like Cass A, like iron and silicon, and measure where they are. And we see evidence for silicon moving faster than iron in different locations. Yeah. So the asymmetry in the polarization, that's related to some large scale um, electric field, magnetic field, or something? Or no, no, it's just electron scattering. So if you take a photosphere, um, the polarization is going to come from the last scattering of the electrons, which, um, of the photons off of electrons, into the beam so that you're looking at. In the, in the photosphere. Where does it come from? Well, that's the question, right? It comes from the explosion, I think. Right? These things are just fundamentally asymmetric, so they're not spherical. Um, yeah, and so in things like Cass A, where we have mixing and overturn of elements that break the traditional onion skin picture of a star, um, we must have some mechanism that causes that mixing and overturn, and that's got to come from the supernova mechanism itself in order to re rearrange these heavy elements like this. All right, so from a theoretical perspective, core collapse supernovae is a major multiphysics grand challenge. All four fundamental forces play an important role in the core collapse supernova mechanism. Gravity, electromagnetic, the weak force, the strong force, and they're all fully coupled um, in a system where you have to solve 3D magneto uh, hydrodynamics, general relativity, Boltzmann neutrino transport, uh, and you also have a, a mixture of complex microphysics, including a nuclear equation of state, which is uncertain, uh, neutrino interactions, some of which are uncertain, and uh, and cross sections and neutrino mixing angles, which we don't know if that plays an important role in the mechanism, um, and all of these different uncertainties, which add a great deal of complexity to the calculation. And so I really think that you've got to have 21st century tools to attack this problem. We've been wrestling with it since the mid 20th century, uh, but you need things like modern microphysics. You've got to have cutting edge numerical uh, algorithms, and you need big computers, and we now have petascale computers. Maybe we need exascale. And you've got to have a sophisticated software infrastructure that can utilize all of those things, bring them together, and actually get you some science results out of it. Um, I like to put this quote up from Hans Bethe in his 1990 seminal review. And he said, the main trouble with the old calculations was that the computers available in the 1960s were not big enough and fast enough for the kind of calculation that has been found necessary in modern theories. It was great, right? This is 1990 talking about the 1960s. But he could have easily said this about the 2000s, right? We're still wrestling with this problem uh, of needing bigger iron. But I think now in this decade, really, with the current machines we have, we're really starting to make progress on this. The hardware really has caught up. Our understanding of the physics that goes into this, the numerical algorithms that we're using, all of these things really are starting to converge now. And I think we're making some tremendous progress on really tackling the core collapse mechanism. So I said I'd mention some equation of state stuff. And the equation of state for dense matter is a critical ingredient. I mentioned it on the previous slide uh, to our calculations. And there's several different models for the nuclear equation of state. 
that are used in supernova simulations. And this is a plot actually from a paper by Tobias Fisher uh, and, uh, and others, plotting many of the different equations of state that are used in supernova calculations. There's many other equations of state that you can have for dense matter, but these are the ones that we can use in supernova simulations because they go to finite temperature um, and in excess of nuclear density. And we have several observational constraints plotted on here, uh, one of which is the fact that we observe two solar mass neutron stars, right? And that's a pretty tight air bar on that two solar mass neutron star. And then these gray shaded regions are from measuring the mass radius relationship for several neutron stars. Okay, so you basically get this sweet zone in here and it's got to go above two solar masses. And many of the classical equations of state that we use in this field, such as uh, the Shen equation of state, which is out here, this dash dotted red line, it gets a two solar mass neutron star just fine, but it produces a really big neutron star, which seems to be ruled out from observations of cold neutron stars. The other one that's very common to use is Latimer and Zwesti, particularly the one most favored these days is the one with the incompressibility of 220 MeV, and that's because it just makes a two solar mass neutron star but it's still a little fat for a neutron star in terms of its radius. Not too bad. Um, it is a bit softer than Shen, so it's a co more compact neutron star, but stiff enough to give you a two solar mass neutron star. Um, and then several others are on here. One from uh, Andrew Steiner and uh, Tobias Fischer and uh, Matthias Hempel uh, is the yellow lines here. And this is a parametric equation of state which was tuned to give you um, both the radius and the mass that observations seem to indicate. Um, and uh, this equation of state is being used now in, in supernova simulations. We're actually using it in 2D simulations. Uh, Chris Sullivan, who's in the room here, um, is working on that with, with me and Evan O'Connor. Um, so the nuclear equation of state is a critical ingredient to these types of simulations. It can impact whether or not a star even blows up as a supernova, how energetic that explosion is, um, it can affect things like the gravitational wave emission because most of the gravitational wave emission from a supernova comes from the, the densest part, it comes from the neutron star. And that structure of the neutron star is going to be determined directly by the equation of state. It can also influence the neutrino emission. So things like actual detectability and what you would see from a supernova can depend on the equation of state. And if you knew things like the equation of state very well, you could place some constraints given an observation of a supernova and neutrinos. Okay. So what's the basic picture of stellar core collapse? Well, you get a big star above eight to 10 solar masses. It can actually fuse elements all the way to iron and it produces an iron core. Now iron is inert. You can't get any positive energy out of reactions involving iron. And so it sits there and builds up and it builds up to a Chandrasekhar mass. It's effective Chandrasekhar mass around 1.4, 1.5 solar masses, at which point it has a central density of 10 to the 10 grams per cc, electron fraction of about 0.4. So somewhat neutron rich, but not. Uh, massively so. Its radius is about 2,000 kilometers. Now, once it hits that Chandrasekhar mass, a true gravitational instability sets in, the type that Chandrasekhar really envisioned. This doesn't actually happen in, in type 1a supernovae. This is often the story that you hear. You know, a white dwarf goes up to Chandrasekhar mass, it collapses and blows up. That never actually happens. The white dwarf blows up before it actually gets to the Chandrasekhar mass, right? It ignites carbon before that collapse occurs. But the collapse actually occurs for these iron cores. Um, it's accelerated by proton captures, or uh, I'm sorry, electron captures onto protons, which rob the core of energy. This core is supported primarily by electron degeneracy pressure. So if you're capturing electrons onto protons, you're losing that source of pressure. Furthermore, as it heats up and contracts, photodissociation of iron nuclei costs you about 8 MeV per nucleon um, of energy, and that robs more pressure from the core, and the collapse is accelerated. And it's a true instability process and it collapses from 2,000 kilometers down to 50 kilometers in the space of a couple hundred milliseconds, fraction of a second, okay? And it goes to densities in excess of nuclear density, a few times 10 to the 14 grams per cc. Now at this point, this is where the nuclear equation of state really kicks in. Um, that inner portion of uh, the nuclear reaction becomes stiff, it becomes repulsive, uh, and it stops the collapse rather suddenly. And it sends out a pretty strong shock wave. At this point, the central electron fractions are around a quarter, 0.3, somewhere in that inner area. Um, and in this process of collapse, about three times 10 to the 53 erg of energy is released. Now that's a few hundred times the typical kinetic energy of a supernova, all right? That much binding energy is released through the process of this collapse. And each one of these electron captures releases an electron-type neutrino 
about 10 to the 57 them, of them are made in the core collapse process. So quite a few. Okay, so once we collapse this thing, it's, uh, the core bounces when the strong force becomes repulsive. It sends that shock wave out. The rest of the star is still trying to accrete onto this proto-neutron star. The shock wave goes out and eventually stalls. Um, it used to be thought that this bounce shock that was formed is what the supernova mechanism was, that just the stiffening of the equation of state was what blew these stars up. But more modern calculations, even earlier calculations, showed that the shock would lose too much energy to dissociating um, iron nuclei and to continued neutrino losses. This matter is very hot, and it's radiating neutrinos quite copiously, and so that carries away energy. And so the shock eventually stalls around 150 kilometers in radius um, and turns into an accretion shock. The rest of the star is still accreting through this shock, trying to fall onto the neutron star, um, while all this action going on behind the shock is holding it up. Um, and so the supernova problem, in a sense, is we've got this stalled shock. This is our initial condition. What revives the shock, turns it around, and blows the star up? The leading idea is the neutrino heating mechanism, which was first proposed by Sterling Colgate in 1966. Uh, and revised as the delayed neutrino heating mechanism in 1985 by Hans Beta and Wilson. Um, so I said that core's binding energy releases 10 to the 53 erg of energy through the collapse process. Most of that is going to come out as neutrinos as this proto-neutron star core cools over the course of about 10 seconds. Um, so any successful mechanism must tap that energy somehow. It's the, it's the elephant in the room in terms of energy budget. Um, and the medium is so dense here that neutrinos are actually diffusive in the neutron star. They're trapped and they diffuse out um, on a relevant time scale. You only need 1% of this total energy to drive an explosion, right? 10 to the 51 erg. But you really have to trap about 10% of the flux in order to make the supernova successful. So it is stiffer than a 1% problem. And we've got this time scale. We've only got about one second to drive the explosion. Otherwise, too many neutron stars would collapse to black holes because remember, accretion is continuing. Um, or otherwise, we just have too heavy, massive uh, neutron stars. This is tough to do in 1D. In fact, most 1D calculations of this process fail to find explosions. 2D is a little bit more promising. So really now we have uh, several examples of really high fidelity um, two-dimensional simulations. Um, and this takes high resolution. It takes really good neutrino transport, which is expensive. Um, and good microphysics. And so there are several examples of explosions now in 2D, both from the Garshin group and uh, also from the Oak Ridge group over there on the left, and recently work that I've done with uh, Evan O'Connor. Uh, we find 2D explosions in high fidelity simulations. Yep. How consistent are these? Not. They're not consistent. That's the big problem. So everybody basically finds quantitatively different results and qualitatively different results. So for the Garshin group, a few, uh, a few progenitors blow up, right? They don't get to the 10 to the 51 erg of kinetic energy mark. They get to about a tenth of a beta, so one tenth below that. Um, whereas for the Oak Ridge group, they're finding successful explosions across a range of progenitors, and they're quite energetic, nearly 10 to the 51 erg. And so qualitatively different. Uh, we're finding somewhere in between as well, um, where some progenitors blow up, some don't. Uh, it's more similar to what Garshin is finding. But if you look at other results from like the Princeton group, they recently had 2D simulations, none of them blew up. And uh, they have an updated paper recently where most of them don't blow up, but one of them actually does. So there's just qualitative disagreement in 2D about what's going on and what stars are gonna blow up, how they're gonna blow up, how energetic it's gonna be. Um, I mentioned this work with Evan O'Connor. So this is new stuff, it's out on the archive. Um, and we find some blow up, but some don't. We also found that general relativity is very important. This is not shocking. We've known for a while that the influence of general relativity is important in this process. Uh, but we found that for purely Newtonian simulations, none of them blew up. But when you include general relativity, or at least the effects of GR on gravity, um, you can get explosions. And this is due to a hardening of the neutrino spectrum. Um, OK. But we want to talk about 3D. So 2D, it's a bit confusing. We need to figure out why we're getting different results, what the qualitative differences are, and where our simulation results are diverging. But really, we know that supernovae are three-dimensional objects, and we've got to face this problem in 3D at some point. And for reasons that I'll go into later in the talk, I think 2D might be a little misleading. We've really got to do this problem in 3D. And now we're able to do this, right? Moore's law has allowed us. 
we're up to 20 petaflop uh, computers now. We can really start to tackle this problem with some fidelity in 3D. And we can start to ask some big questions. Is 3D the key to a successful explosion mechanism? What new surprises might be lurking in that third dimension? Um, what are the dominant instabilities that, that really are key to the mechanism? And how does 3D compare to 2D? Can we just do 2D simulations and know that they're going to reproduce 3D results with some fidelity? Okay, so early on, this, was, uh, this is now several years ago, um, this first question was addressed. If going to 3D was the key to getting successful explosions, it was still pretty hard in 2D, nearly impossible in 1D, but maybe if you extrapolate that line, 3D is even easier. Um, and here, there was also qualitative disagreement in the results. And these were very simple, almost purely hydrodynamic simulations where you dialed in the neutrinos. You basically set your neutrino luminosity by hand and you look to see how low you could turn that luminosity and still get an explosion. And then compare that critical luminosity between 2D and 3D. And what the Princeton group found was that, yeah, okay, it's easier in 3D, great. But this was not re reproduced by Garshing. And so this was one of the first things I did when I adapted my code to treat supernova physics was look at this dialed in neutrino um, process using what's called a light bulb and see if 3D is easier. And what I found was no, actually 2D was substantially easier to get explosions than 3D. Um, and that was surprising. And what we wanted to do from there was really improve on that. That neutrino light bulb scheme is very simple. You're dialing a lot of things by hand um, and not self-consistently computing things like the heating rate due to neutrinos. So it's unclear if that really is a result that's going to hold up in more uh, sophisticated simulations. So with Evan O'Connor, uh, we implemented what's called a neutrino leakage scheme, which is still not transport. We're not actually doing real transport here, but we are self-consistently computing um, the flux of the neutrinos and the heating due to neutrinos via charge current reactions. Um, and we have a tunable parameter here that we can tune up and down to get explosions or not. And what we found is that without any extra additional heating, 3D didn't explode, but 2D did. Okay, so again, 2D was easier to explode than 3D. And 2D was also a lot more asymmetric. There was more evidence for things like the standing increase of shock instability in 2D than in 3D. This is what that looks like. So this is one of our simulations from uh, my paper with Evan. Uh, for a 27 solar mass star in 3D, again, using neutrino leakage. But these are very high resolution simulations, um, even though we're not doing full fidelity transport. So what you're seeing here is the entropy. The blue shaded region is the shock surface. Um, the orange is neutrino driven convection behind the shock. And this one looks like it wants to blow up but then the shock begins to recede and kind of settles close to the proto-neutron star. Convection starts to die down. The gain region where neutrinos are actually heating the matter almost disappears. And you get this late phase of standing accretion shock instability, which has this typical sloshing behavior to it and in 3D a sort of spiral action to the shock. And this didn't blow up. And so around that, oops, around that same time, not long after that, the first 3D simulations using real neutrino transport came into the literature. And uh, these are very expensive calculations. Each one of these 3D simulations using fairly moderate resolution um, required tens to 100 million CPU hours to do one simulation. So this is a very, very expensive endeavor. Uh, and this was from the Garshin group. And what they found was that all else being equal, 3D didn't blow up, whereas 2D did. So we might have a problem. Now, they did later uh, update some of these results, and they found that for stars that blow up in 1D, 1D simulation, they do, do also blow up in 3D, so that's good. Um, and if you change some of the microphysics of the neutrino interactions, you can get explosions. So this is indicating that many of these progenitors that we're working with are very marginal. They're close to explosion. If you kick them the right way, you can get them to go over that stability threshold and blow up. But it's not all bad news in 3D. The Oak Ridge group recently uh, published their first 3D result and found that it blows up for a 15 solar mass star. So that's good. Um, now, it does blow up later and less energetically than the comparable 2D simulation. So again, things aren't easier in 3D, they're harder. Um, but it is a successful explosion. Um, now, these simulations from Oak Ridge and also from Garshing, in spherical polar coordinates, they're using two degree resolution. Okay, and that's important. Um, that's fairly low resolution, but these are extremely expensive calculations and we do what we can. 
Okay, so why does 2D explode? Why does 3D explode? Where 1D doesn't? What's going on in multi-D that helps the explosion mechanism? And does that point the way to understanding what we can do to get a strong, robust supernova mechanism? So there are several multidimensional effects that help here. One is proto-neutron star convection, which is going on down here. And this liberates higher neutrino luminosity. It dredges up those neutrinos, lets them escape quicker, higher luminosities. And then in the gain region here, right behind the shock, uh, convection here increases the typical matter dwell times. Remember, everything is accreting towards this proto-neutron star. If you can get stuff to hang out, on average, a little bit longer in this region where it's absorbing neutrino energy, you should absorb more neutrino energy. Uh, and then the standing accretion shock instability, which I mentioned before, which has this characteristic sloshing mode, stochastically expands the size of the gain region, bringing more mass into the gain region, thus enhancing neutrino heating. So all of these things operate together to basically make multidimensional simulations more efficient at trapping the radiated neutrino energy. And thus, they blow up. That's the idea. That's the standard picture. Um, now, what we did, we put that standard picture to the test. What this standard picture implies is that all else being equal, you have to absorb between 1D and 3D the same net amount of neutrino energy. It's just that 3D and 2D are more efficient than 1D at trapping neutrino energy. Okay, but that threshold, the actual energy that you need, should be roughly the same. Okay? We looked at this with parameterized simulations, and what we found is that 3D absorbs only when you get an explosion, critical 3D explosions compared to critical 1D explosions. They just barely blow up. In 3D, you absorb half as much total neutrino energy as 1D. It's a factor of two different. Something else is helping 2D and 3D simulations blow up besides just the straight up neutrino heating. What we suggest was that the answer is turbulence. And so this convection in the gain region, right behind the shock, that's driven by the neutrino heating, is extremely violent. It has Mach numbers of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, uh, and even higher in some cases. And so it's dynamically important. It's comparable in some cases to the background thermal pressure in terms of uh, the pressure it exerts on the fluid. And so if you were to look at something like this, which the red curve is an angle average uh, radial velocity from a 3D simulation, and I've marked with the, uh, the dash, the black dash line, the location of the shock at this point. You basically have something where you have the shock jump conditions. On the upstream side, you have the ram pressure of the accretion flow, which has to be balanced on the downstream side by the, the thermal pressure and the ram pressure of the downstream. And if you do this type of analysis on an angle average 3D simulation, you find that you're actually missing a term. Okay? This balance doesn't work out in 3D. Not even close. Okay, so you'd underestimate the location of the shock. What's missing is a term proportional to the turbulent pressure. And this was first pointed out by Jeremiah Murphy, um, that if you do a classic Reynolds decomposition of the turbulence in the gain region, you find that you can add this term here, which is the RR component of the Reynolds stress times the density. That's a turbulent pressure. And then it works. And then this analysis works almost perfectly. So the turbulent pressure in the gain region is aiding shock expansion in a substantial way. Okay, and the turbulence is strong. So if you take a look at the turbulent pressure compared to the background thermal pressure, um, what you find is that it's as high as 50% of the background thermal pressure at any given time. So it's about an order one effect, okay? So, and without this turbulent pressure, you'd grossly underestimate where you think the shock should be. And this uh, turbulence is driven by the neutrino, so it's tied up with the neutrino mechanism tightly. Okay, so just a little background on turbulence, which might be useful. So classic Komogorov type turbulence makes three basic assumptions, that the turbulence is isotropic, it's the same in all directions, it's steady state, it's not time dependent, uh, and it's incompressible, so that the Mach numbers are small. Okay, and we often look at turbulence in terms of a Fourier decomposition of for instance, the log of the kinetic energy in the turbulence. And it has this characteristic scaling where at some scale we're putting energy into the turbulence. That's the driving scale. And at these large scales here, most of the kinetic energy is contained. Now from the driving scale, kinetic energy in the turbulence is transported through what's known as the inertial range. And here, no kinetic energy is being created or destroyed in the turbulence, that is. It's only being transported from large scales to small. And then you hit the dissipation range where 
uh, the physical viscosity actually becomes comparable to your small scale Reynolds number and you dissipate that turbulent kinetic energy as heat. So you have these three important regions. And for Komolgorov's type turbulence, in the inertial range, you have a very characteristic scaling in Fourier space of k to the minus five-thirds of the kinetic energy. So what about supernova turbulence? Well, it basically breaks all of those assumptions. It's anisotropic. It's only quasi-stationary. There is some time dependence to it. It's weakly compressible. Mach numbers, like we said earlier, can get up as high as 0.5. And uh, there's more kinetic energy on large scales. We're having technical difficulties here. There it is. Maybe my thing is loose. Okay. And what we found from the simulations is that more kinetic energy on the large scales, so it's small k or small l, is correlated with the likelihood for explosion. Um, so these are actually kinetic energy spectra from three-dimensional simulations um, of supernovae. This is in spherical harmonic space, but it's just like a Fourier decomposition. Um, so not only is more kinetic energy on large scales favorable, what we find is that the scaling through the inertial range is not five-thirds, it's shallower. It's closer to minus one, actually. Um, and so there's a, a lot of open questions about how we can understand the turbulence in the supernova context that beg a lot of investigation. Um, one other important thing about the supernova turbulence that I mentioned, it's anisotropic. So it's actually stronger in the radial direction. And this is because it's being driven by convection. And the convection is essentially happening in the radial direction. And so that, that driving from convection makes the turbulence stronger in the radial direction. Um, so we can write down some equations. I swear this is the only derivation I'll do in the talk. Um, where we have our turbulent pressure there, which I've just defined. Okay, so this top line is the shock jump conditions, right? The balancing of the ram pressure in the upstream with the downstream thermal pressure, turbulent pressure, and ram pressure. Now, we wrote that turbulent pressure as the density times the RR component of the Reynolds stress. We can just write that as the density times the velocity fluctuation in the turbulence in the radial direction. So that total velocity perturbation, V prime squared, is just the sum of the various squared components. And if we defined, is this back yet? Okay, it's back. Um, and if we define the, the specific kinetic energy in the turbulence as just one half V prime squared, we can make some assumptions by saying that um, in the radial directions it's stronger and roughly a factor of two stronger than any of the transverse directions and simplify these equations a little bit. And then we can make the assumption that what if my turbulent pressure can be described by a gamma law equation of state, gamma minus one times the density times the specific internal energy. Solving these with the assumptions that we made about anisotropy, we find that the, the gamma of the turbulence is two. The background thermal gamma is four thirds for radiation dominated gas. In other words, the turbulent equation of state is a lot stiffer than the thermal equation of state. Another way to think about that is that per unit specific internal energy, the turbulence gives you way more pressure than the thermal state of the gas. It's more efficient at pushing the shock out than the thermal state of the gas. So it's very important for understanding the shock stability in a supernova, uh, the turbulence. This also gives us a way to look at the question of 2D versus 3D. If turbulence is really important for the stability of this standing shock, then we might be able to understand the differences between 2D and 3D because in 2D, turbulence behaves very differently than in 3D. Um, in 3D, you get this characteristic forward cascade of energy, like I was talking about, where kinetic energy in the turbulence moves from large scales to small. In 2D simulations, you actually get the opposite, the inverse cascade, where this energy transports from small scales to large. One way of thinking about this is that in 3D, things like a convective bubble, which is driving the turbulence, get shredded apart. And so a big bubble is shredded into small pieces. In 2D, small bubbles merge. And you can see this just by watching movies of the simulations. That's actually what happens. Small bubbles merge together and make larger bubbles in 2D. The opposite is going on in 3D. There's more of a shredding action. And that's just a reflection of this inverse cascade in turbulence, okay? And I told you earlier that kinetic energy on large scales in the turbulence is correlated with success for explosion, chance for explosion. And so this is precisely what we see when we do this decomposition of the turbulence in 2D versus 3D. 2D has more energy on large scales, it has more energy overall in the turbulence, and it's more likely to blow up. Or someone put it, there's lies 
band lies in 2D turbulence. Which is true in this context. Okay, so is the neutrino mechanism in trouble? It certainly seems like the success that we've been seeing in some 2D simulations might not be recovered in 3D. But this has got to be telling us that we're either missing physics or getting some of the physics wrong because we know these things blow up. And there's a lot of possibilities for things that we could do better. Things like we don't know the equation of state. If we knew that precisely, that could be the answer. Uh, we don't know all of the neutrino effects that might be important, things that we typically ignore like flavor swapping. There's some cross sections that we don't include um, or could know better. Um, the behavior of uh, turbulence and low resolution effects, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we typically ignore rotation MHD, but all stars rotate and have a magnetic field. Uh, and also the progenitor structures. And that's something I will talk about. So, high mass stellar evolution. This is a solved problem, right? This is what we learn in our Astro 101 classes. Big stars burn hydrogen to helium, uh, helium to carbon, carbon to oxygen, neon magnesium to silicon, then finally to iron. It's all in this beautiful onion skin structure with spherically symmetric shells all the way out. It's a nice 1D picture. Absolutely. This is not what a high mass star looks like, certainly not at the end of its life. Stars are messy. They're really ugly on the inside, actually. They're very violent. The silicon burning that builds up that iron core releases a ton of energy, which drives very strong convection. Um, in 2D, this is a 2D simulation here on the left of silicon burning and the convection driven by that silicon burning. Uh, the velocities are upward of 1,000 kilometers a second in that convection surrounding the iron core. Okay. And then when we look at real stars, this is a picture, a simulated picture of Betelgeuse, and it's produced from real data. It is a simulated image, but from real uh, astroseismological data. And that's what the surface of Betelgeuse would look like to the unaided human eye. So not only are big fat stars asymmetric on the inside, they're asymmetric on the outside too. So does it matter? Does this matter at all for the supernova mechanism? So we put this to the test too. This is work with Christian Ott. Uh, what we did was take an otherwise one-dimensional spherically symmetric progenitor star, uh, map it into our 3D code, and add velocity perturbations, scaled to match what we saw in 2D simulations. So roughly the same spatial scale uh, and roughly the same peak velocities. And then we ran it. We left the inner iron core, which is here, perfectly symmetric. And then asked the question, does this have any effect on the supernova mechanism? So these are the two simulations, one unperturbed on the left. This is a 15 solar mass star. And then the perturbed one on the right, all else equal. The perturbations hit about now. The one on the left, the shock recedes. The one on the right, the shock continues to expand and is beginning to transition to an explosion. So by adding these fluctuations, we turned a dud into an explosion. Now, obviously, this star was right on the edge of blowing up. It was a marginally stable configuration to begin with, but the perturbations added just enough kick to push it over that edge and cause an explosion. So it triggered an explosion. So what was going on here? I think you can understand this from the perspective of enhancing the turbulence. By adding these fairly large scale fluctuations to the progenitor star, we gave finite amplitude seeds to the convection that drives the turbulence in the gain region. And so the growth rate was just larger, right, for the convection and the turbulence. And so what we saw was that the mean Mach number of the turbulence was larger in the perturbed case than the unperturbed case. And in terms of the kinetic energy in the turbulence, there was more kinetic energy overall in the perturbed case, and it was preferentially on those large scales. That were so, that's helpful to uh, explosion. Back. Sorry everyone, we're having technical difficulties here in the room. Zoom seems to be working perfectly. <laughs> so 
Oh my God. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to keep on going. All right. It's back for the moment. All right. So the, the explanation is simple. Those perturbations resulted in stronger convection, thus stronger turbulence, and thus explosion. All right. And that reminded us that the supernova mechanism is at its heart an initial value problem. And we might have problems with our initial values. Okay. Stars are not perfectly spherical. Uh, they all rotate. They all have magnetic fields. Greater than half of the stars that lead to supernovae are in interacting binaries. So not just binary systems, but stars, systems where uh, the two companion stars share mass at some point in their history, uh, which can alter the evolution of the stars. We typically ignore most of these things in our, our high fidelity supernova calculations. Um, well, understandably, it's a hard problem by itself. This stellar evolution is an extremely hard problem. Um, and we, it wasn't clear that it mattered. Um, but the thing is, the supernova problem, this persistence that we're not able to get robust explosions, might not even exist. We might just be using initial conditions that don't occur in nature. So we might not be surprised that we're not getting something that looks like nature. It's a possibility. So what about this first part? Can we do anything about the fact that uh, we are ignoring the aspherical nature of these progenitor stars? Um, what uh, myself, along with a postdoc at University of Chicago, Manos Atsopoulos, and Dave Arnett and Frank Timmies did, was to rewind the clock on our supernova calculation by a few minutes and take a progenitor star about three minutes before the point of its collapse, map it into 3D, and follow the nuclear burning, the roughly hydrostatic nuclear burning, and build up of the iron core. We watched about two-tenths of a solar mass of iron be synthesized by silicon burning um, using a fairly limited nuclear network. So this was an approximate network. To really do silicon burning requires 150 isotopes in a network, really. Um, we had a whopping 21, um, so not quite enough, but it gets the energetics right. Um, it gets the silicon burning to iron roughly right. It does not get the electron capture right, and so that was parameterized in our network. Um, but this allowed us to do three minutes of evolution in 3D. So what you're seeing here is the speed, just the convective speed. This is the iron, so the ash of the burning. This is silicon, uh, so the fuel for the burning. And then this is the specific nuclear energy release rate, where blue is negative, that's net cooling, um, and orange colors are positive. So you see, even the burning itself is by any means not asymmetric, uh, not symmetric. And the convective speeds are upwards of 500 kilometers a second in 3D. And right about now, it becomes unstable. So we watch the iron core build up to its effective Chandrasekhar mass, at which point the gravitational instability sets in and the star collapses. Another way to look at this is the radial velocity. So this is a volume rendering of the radial velocity where blue is positive coming at you, uh, red is negative going away from you. Um, and again, we see velocities of a few hundred kilometers per second. You're looking at an octant here. That was all we were able to afford, not a full star, but an octant of 3D. And then after about 150 seconds or so, uh, gravitational instability sets in. But another thing you can see from this movie is that the convection is large scale. These plumes are big. This is not really fine grain convection. Uh, this is fairly large scale convection. Okay, so why was this tough? Why aren't all stellar models 3D? Well, you've got a problem with time scale. The evolution of these massive stars is millions of years. The buildup of the iron core is a few days, maybe as long as a few weeks for lower mass progenitors. The collapse happens in a split second. So you have this enormous range in time scales. You have an enormous range in length scales. Stars are hundreds of thousands of kilometers in extent. The iron core is a few thousand kilometers in extent. And using explicit methods like what we did for this simulation, to study stellar evolution in its entirety for a massive star would take something like 10 to the 15 time steps. It would be waiting a very long time to finish that simulation. Even with implicit methods in multi-D, you only get about a factor of 10 improvement in terms of your numerical number of time steps. So still, that's a non-starter. In 1D, you can do this by evolving only the background state implicitly. And all the multi-dimensional effects which are occurring at high speed uh, are mocked up with approximations like mixing link theory. And this allows you to take much larger time steps. You can do uh, the entirety of a massive stellar evolution in 10,000 steps maybe, or 10,000 models. So that makes it tractable. For us, what we did was a fully explicit finite volume approach. Again, I said 21 isotopes, it's not big enough. 
We had to approximate the electron capture. We did use adaptive mesh refinement. And even with those approximations and tricks, we only could do three minutes. Um, and we also had some issues with initial transients in terms of mapping um, from the 1D structure to the 3D. But we'd actually fix those now in our, our more recent work. OK, so is this the way towards explosion? What we did was to take that 3D progenitor that we, we evolved in three, 3D for three minutes and put it into the collapse code. We let the collapse continue. We turned on the neutrino physics. It was all the same code. We just turned off the network and turned on the neutrinos. And what we found is compared to a 1D progenitor, uh, the 3D exploded more rapidly and with more energy. Both of them actually exploded. And in this case, the blue line is the angle average of that 3D progenitor star. We took it. We angle average it down to 1D and then use that as our initial conditions for 3D. So that got rid of all non-radial velocities um, and all non-radial structure. But it was essentially the same star. But this demands further exploration. I wouldn't really trust this progenitor because the electron fraction and entropy in the core is not going to be right because of the network. Um, but it's a first step. And we're trying to take <laughs> a few more baby steps in this direction now by expanding our nuclear network doing a better job with the physics, doing a better job with the stellar evolution before we map it into 3D. But this work is ongoing. Okay, so I've talked a lot about turbulence, and turbulence seems to be helpful in driving explosions, and that seems encouraging, but turbulence is also the bad news, okay? So there's that, a quote from Werner Heisenberg that I love. I'll just let you read that. Um, but tur turbulence is a problem, okay? In our simulations, we're certainly not getting it right. So we're, we often characterize turbulence by the Reynolds number, which is a ratio of inertial to viscous forces. The physical Reynolds number is something like 10 to the fifth, uh, 17. Now, numerically, in our simulations, we're limited by our grid scale resolution and the types of techniques that we use to do the simulation. We're maybe only getting to 200. And so we're not getting the behavior of the turbulence correct. In particular, we're not getting this inertial range and the cascade of energy from large scales to small scales correctly. We are trapping energy at large scales because our cascade is inefficient, because our, our resolution is too big. If we're trapping energy on large scales, that probably means we're overestimating likelihood for explosion. We looked at this. We, we rewound the problem a little bit. We put it in a box. We did a simpler case where we just had anisotropic driven turbulence in a box. This is work from David Radice. And we cranked up the resolution as high as we could go until we started to see something that looked like the correct inertial range. And the upshot is that that resolution required to get something that behaves like turbulence is roughly 10 times the resolution that we currently use in our 3D simulations. All the other cases, we trap that kinetic energy at large scale, something called the bottleneck effect. OK. And uh, David continued this study, put it into what looks like a supernova. So this is now. Uh, mocked up initial conditions using analytic solution to an accretion shock uh, with simple heating and cooling to mock up the convection and the neutrinos and a fixed mass accretion rate and a fixed inner boundary. And we did a resolution study. So this is two degree resolution study, which is what the current high fidelity 3Ds are doing. One degree, half degree, which is roughly the resolution that I was using in my approximate neutrino simulations, and then even a little bit higher. And so this is what this looks like. So the effect of having too small of a numerical Reynolds number or too coarse a resolution is that your artificial viscosity, your numerical viscosity is too large. So you're basically simulating molasses when you'd really like to be simulating air. Those two things don't behave like each other. And so we're, we're hampered by this. We're not getting the turbulence right. But the important part that we found in this study is that if you crank the high resolution high enough, you do recover something that looks like Komolgorov's theory of turbulence, scaling of k to the minus 5 thirds. Now, that's a bit surprising uh, because supernova turbulence, like I said earlier, breaks all of the three fundamental assumptions of Komolgorov's theory of turbulence. But still, at high enough resolution, it behaves like uh, typical hydrodynamic turbulence. That's a positive thing. That's a good thing because it means that whole body of literature uh, about turbulence and subgrid models for turbulence might apply to our specific case here. We don't have to start from, from zero. Um, okay, this is the last thing. I'll just skip a few slides since I'm coming close to the end. Um, 
If turbulence is helping explosions, this could be important for making connections to things like nucleosynthesis and uh, the high density equation of state. If we drive the explosions artificially in 1D, like I've done here in this plot, you end up putting all of that extra heating in, uh, you, you need some extra pressure to cause the explosion. That all goes into the thermal state of the gas because that's all you've got. But in 3D, you also have the turbulent pressure which can help the thermal pressure push the shock out. And so that's why 3D blows up at lower heating. But that also means the entropy and the electron fraction in two critical explosions in 1D and 3D are gonna look fairly different. And that's what I'm showing here. The solid line is a 3D case. Uh, the dashed line is the 1D case. And both of these are explosions with similar properties. Same explosion energy. The shock trajectories look very similar. But the YE and the entropy is very different. And this is going to be the case. In nucleosynthesis, we typically use 1D simulations. Not always, but it's easy to do large sets of 1D simulations. You have to artificially drive these things to blow up. There's several ways of doing it. Things like pistons, they add momentum. Thermal bombs had heat, pushing them. You can add heat without changing the electron fraction. But in a real supernova, you've got the neutrino eating plus that turbulent pressure support. So is there a way that we can mock this up uh, that will reproduce in 1D more faithfully the 3D results? Uh, and this is something I'm working on, pressing stars to explode, if you will, uh, to try to account for this turbulent pressure in 1D. And what I'm doing is basically taking mixing length theory to give me an estimate for the convective or the turbulent velocities that we're seeing um, in 3D simulations. And I can use my 3D simulations to tune the free parameters in this model. Um, not all of the equations are up here, but some of the salient ones are. So we make the assumption that the pressure scales like the density times the velocity fluctuation scapes squared. I can take that turbulent pressure and put it into the equations of hydrodynamics that I'm solving numerically and treat it like an additional pressure term. Um, not a thermodynamic pressure, but a turbulent pressure. And then using mixing length theory, I can find out what my uh, velocity fluctuation is. And this is just an example of a real 3D case is the red line. And then the, the very simple model is the blue and green lines. And so with very reasonable parameters, we can make something that's of the right order of magnitude and giving us convection in the right place. Okay, so this is based on a Ludo criterion for convection. And then here, L is the mixing length. So this is a very, very simple, basically back of the envelope calculation, right? But you can get the right scaling in the right place, and then you can add that pressure into the hydrodynamics, which is a step I haven't done yet. <laughs> but this is something we're working on. I'm gonna skip the part about MHD because I'm running out of time. But it was a bunch of cool movies, I'm sorry. All right, uh, so we need a theory of core collapse supernovae. We don't have one, it's very hard to make a direct connection to observations and experiment. And a lot of things in astrophysics and nuclear physics are left uncertain. And this is a long-standing problem. It's been around for over half a century. And I think with 21st century tools, we're within reach of a realistic solution to this problem. So we still have some problems. We still have some issues to overcome. Current 3D explosions seem to be less energetic and uh, less uh, prolific than 2D. But turbulence might be crucial. But we have issues with turbulence. We're not getting enough resolution to really model the turbulence accurately, and we have to address that at some point in 3D. Uh, it looks like progenitor structure in 3D is gonna be critical as well. That's an, something that needs to be explored. And if we wanna make a robust connection to nucleosynthesis results and the high energy, uh, high density equation of state, I mean, uh, we really need a sound theory for the explosion that, that works. But uh, I think we're almost there. So I'll thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Um, I suggest that people at MSU start asking questions and all the other participants, if you have questions, please uh, indicate to me in the chat. Yeah, I'm going to call. So, um, Could you please re uh, repeat the questions when you get uh, yeah. them asked? Yeah. Okay. So Rimko asked, is it possible to take the turbulence and do it in a small box where the problem is tractable and then translate that to our large scale simulations and somehow put that um, into our large scale simulations? And yes. The, that's what we're working on now in some sense. That's a subgrid model. It's a very common in turbulence theory to have a subgrid model 
um, which is tuned to direct numerical simulations where you can actually solve the, the problem directly. So that's what we're working on. This is, we're getting there stepwise. So first we, you know, we really, we had to know if the turbulence was going to behave like Komolgorov type turbulence, where all of these subgrid models might come from. Um, but yes, I mean, I think that's right now the only way forward. Otherwise, we need 10 times the resolution um, to do this directly in the, the, the types of numerical schemes that we use. Um, and that's just not possible, even with current computers. But it seems promising to me that a subgrid model for the turbulence is possible. Um, and that really could make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, Chris. So if we're lucky enough to have a core cloud supernova go off in our galaxy in the next few years, uh, which observations would you be most excited to see? Mm -hmm. So Chris asked, uh, if we were lucky enough to have a core collapse go off in the galaxy sometime soon, what observations would I be most excited to see? Um, all of them? But I think, I think the easy answer is gravitational waves, right? Because we've seen neutrinos before, right? We know that supernova emit neutrinos, but it's never been confirmed that supernovae uh, radiate in gravitational waves, right? It's kind of not confirmed that anything. <laughs> directly at least uh, radiates in gravitational waves unless you believe the rumors. Um, so I think the gravitational waves, close second neutrinos, but then a very close third, everything else, right? All, all the electromagnetic signals, uh, it would completely change our theory. 1987A completely revolutionized our understanding of core collapse supernovae uh, because all of a sudden we had a wealth of data and we realized that we were really wrong uh, about a lot of things. Right about some? Wrong about a lot. Um, so I think, uh, I think all the observations would be exciting. Gravitational waves would probably top the list. Internet? Internet. Okay, Benoit has a question. Uh, yes, uh, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Okay, uh, so uh, from your talk, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, supernova is not, uh, well, it's pretty complicated, highly not spherical. And uh, one of the outcome of these explosions is, of course, as you said, the chemical evolution. And for uh, all the chemical evolution studies, people usually take the years from 1D calculation because they are more uh, affordable. And so I wanted to have uh, your thought on this. So in terms of nucleosynthesis, uh, do you think there is hope in 1D calculation? Um, it's, I can't say for sure, but I rather suspect that the results from the 1D simulations are going to look different than the results from a realistic 3D simulation, um, all else being equal. But, but now, does that mean the entire set of 1D simulations that are carried out for a large range of uh, massive star progenitors uh, and for some IMF, uh, will that look substantially different from realistic 3D calculations? Maybe. I think on a case-by-case -case situation, case-by-case -case scenario, they will be very different. Uh, but in aggregate, on average, how different? I don't know. But I do think it will be different. And that's one of the things that I'm hoping to drive towards uh, in this model for the turbulent pressure in 1D is trying to make something that explodes and has the thermodynamics and the energetics of the 3D explosions, but in 1D. So the entropy and the YE look similar to the 3D. Um, the shock trajectories, the energies look similar to the 3D, more so than if I had artificially driven it in some other way. So I'm hoping to test that. I can't say for sure how big it will be. My suspicion is that there is absolutely going to be a difference from artificially driven 1D explosions and realistic 3D explosions. There has to be. Thank you. And Benoit, aren't you here? Where? You? Uh, yeah, but uh, <laughs> I'm actually at my apartment right now, but I am uh, physically close to you. Yeah, all right. Okay, Gavitino. Um, I don't know if you can hear. Um, a little bit. How might you use exascale computers? I heard exascale computers, but yes, I want one. Is that the question? Yeah. How how might you use exascale computers? So one one easy way. So our our codes typically uh, are parallelized by domain decomposition, and so an easy thing to do with an exascale computer is throw high resolution at it, right? With an exascale computer, I might be able to achieve that 10x increase in resolution that I need to directly simulate the turbulence. Um, that could be possible with an exascale computer. It's kind of close, actually. I've done, I've done the calculation. And 10 times increase in resolution is very expensive. But it might be possible with the exascale. 
Um, the other thing about this problem is that the neutrino transport tends to dominate the runtime. Um, and with an exascale computer, we're going to be able to do the high fidelity neutrino transport at better resolution than what we can do now with 10 petaflop computers. Um, so exascale will help. I'm not going to say that exascale is necessary for a solution to the problem. Um, because I think if we're smart about the numerical techniques that we use, and we have a subgrid model for the turbulence that works and is accurate and is high fidelity, I don't see any reason why we can't solve this problem at the 10 petaflop level. But exascale wouldn't hurt. Thank you. Okay, we also have a question here. I had a question about, have you investigated what the effects of the rotation of the star would be since uh, I expect that you would get some sort of separation between the different isotopes? Um, I have not looked at the influence of rotation on things like chemical mixing, but I have been working on rotating magnetic 3D simulations for a while now um, and it's like, uh, it's like a chain around my neck. I've been running these simulations for years and I haven't yet published them um, because it's really hard. They like to crash. Um, but we are looking at rotation. So this is, this is a case where um, I've stuck in a plausible amount of rotation with a plausible amount of magnetic field. So this thing is not gonna be a jet-driven supernova. It's not gonna be anything like a GRB, but it does have, um, rotation rates and magnetic field strengths that are plucked from what we know currently about uh, stellar evolution with magnetic fields and rotation. So not crazy. Uh, it doesn't produce some magnetically dominated outflow. You can actually see what I'm plotting here is the plasma beta. It only gets down to a thousand. So the pressure, the thermal pressure is still a thousand times stronger than the magnetic pressure. So this thing is fairly weakly magnetic. Now the magnetic field does get amplified. So we're working on rotation. I haven't explored the chemical mixing. Um, I don't have the plot, but what I can show is something like the YE um, in a rotating model, and that does differentiate. But this thing isn't exploding yet, so, um, so I don't know what it would look like in a rotating explosion. That's not really an answer to your question, but it was a way for me to show you the show. I was just curious about how much it had been investigated, is all. Um, for the chemical differentiation due to rotation, I know Anop Wath-Narat has done a lot of stuff looking at uh, how the, the elements mix and become unstable in 3D. Very nice work going all the way out of the star. But I can't remember. I don't think he did any with rotation. But maybe someone out there can correct me. I can't think of Hi, Sean. I have a couple of questions. The first one is, what are the observational signatures of turbulence? What would we look for to identify whether, you know, large-scale turbulence was occurring and at what depth? Yeah. So one possible thing is the neutrino signal. So this is something that Jim Neller has been working on, and I've actually sent him some turbulence data from our simulation. Um, the, the turbulence, as the explosion proceeds and gets to larger radii, uh, could actually modify the neutrino signal in subtle ways that I don't fully understand, but, but Jim has some handle on. Um, so that's one possibility. There might be, uh, might be some uh, signature of the turbulence in the neutrino signal. Um, that's probably one of the best ways. Another, you know, other than that, it's hard, right? Because, you know, using electromagnetic observations like we actually get from astronomy, you know, I, I like to say that... Um, you know, trying to use astronomical observations to understand what's going on with the supernova mechanism is like going to your dermatologist and asking about your heart. There's a lot in between those two things. And so it's really, really tough. And radiation transport is an integral differential equation. You integrate over a lot of stuff uh, in the electromagnetic observations. Um, there could be a signal in the gravitational waves as well, but it would be very hard to suss out from just the regular convection. Um, because the, the convection in 3D will modify that gravi gravitational wave signal, perhaps changing the characteristic frequency, shifting some things around. Um, but we'd have to have really good predictions for the gravitational wave strains, um, and we'd have to have really good gravitational wave observations. Um, I, guess, I guess the most direct measure that I'm aware of that could directly test the, the character of the turbulence in a supernova would come from modifying the neutrino signals. So you don't anticipate any impact on the distribution of ejecta or 
isotopes uh, that you would see in a supernova remnant? It's, it's possible, but it would be hard to differentiate the effect on that from turbulence versus convection, right? It's all wrapped up into the same thing. So I guess my answer is yes, that will be there. But observing that in like a supernova remnant, will that tell you anything about the actual nature of the turbulence per se in the gain region? It's hard for me to imagine that that would be a, a tractable problem. It should be there. It, it, you know, when we look at supernova like Cas A, for instance, the remnant Cas A, um, we should absolutely see the, the effects of convection. But it's implicit in some way, I think. And also in Cas A, for instance, we're not actually seeing uh, all the way to the center of the remnant, so we don't see all of the ejecta. Now, I mean, the effect is going to be there because the turbulence and the convection causes mixing, um, and we know that that's got to be there. But getting a direct handle from the observations on the turbulence without being confounded by all the other things that are going on, I don't know if I'm creative enough to think of an answer to that. Okay, the last question asked about laboratory analogs. Um, Chris, do you mean like hydrodynamic experiments that we could compare to? This is also something that's been tried, laboratory astrophysics. Um, and the idea that, you know, well, Euler's equations are scale invariant, you know, you divide by a typical length scale, you should get the same thing. It's, that's also a really tough thing to do for all of the same reasons I was just tiptoeing around. Yeah, it's been tried and some progress is made. But getting really, really small air bars on those kinds of things is tough. Question? Okay, that's another question. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is the neutrino driven mechanism falsifiable? Uh, and if so, when? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? I, is, I heard neutrino mechanism viable. Is the neutrino driven mechanism falsifiable? And if so, when, right? Is it falsifiable? Falsifiable, yes. Um, I suppose if we had a galactic supernova and we didn't see neutrinos, that would be a case that would falsify um, the neutrino-driven mechanism. But of course, we already have one case where we did see the neutrinos. If we had one in the galaxy and the neutrino emission was well below what we expected, Maybe that would falsify the neutrino mechanism. My question was about your simulation. Yeah, not, not from the observation, from your simulations. Could you falsify the neutrino mechanism? No, no. We theorists are far too creative. We'll come up with a way to make something work. <laughs> I think. I don't know. I think it's very hard. I think it would be very hard to do that. So to prove that the neutrino mechanism is not the mechanism of uh, core collapse supernovae average. Um, at, at this point, you know, there's no better candidate, right? There's lots of other options, um, but they all, all the options, including the neutrino mechanism, um, have their detractions. But one thing you can't escape is that in the theory as we understand it now, um, a lot of energy is stored in the neutrino radiation field, a lot, way more than enough to blow up the star. And it would be extremely surprising, just from an Occam's razor point of view, if that wasn't crucial to the explosion mechanism. If somehow all of that energy just was useless for most supernovae. I have a related question. Oh boy. <laughs> so, you know, you talked about turbulence and you said that because your resolution is not adequate, you're overestimating the role of turbulence. Uh, as you go to higher resolution, maybe it plays a smaller role in uh, the explosion. Yes, that, that's so, a worry, that's my suspicion. Okay, so if we work with that hypothesis, then you'd probably say that with the current simulations, there must be a lower limit to the neutrino energy spectra, uh -huh. you know, at which point you can say that, you know, if the neutrino spectra are less than X MeV, then neutrinos can't play a role in the explosion, can't be essential to the explosion. What would that number be? Well, I guess I would put it at the number that we roughly see now, because they're all marginal or they don't explode. So somewhere in the 15 to 20 MeV range. 
if some nuclear physics were to say that the neutrino spectra were softer by 20 percent uh would that <laughs> you know answer chuck's question yeah i guess it would maybe i mean if if, if you believe if you believe what we have now yeah Okay, any more questions? I'm, I'm being told that we're getting kicked out of this room because it's oh, scheduled. Okay. All right, thank okay, you very Thank much. you very much. Thank you, everyone. See you Bye. in two weeks for the next Bye. seminar. Bye. Bye.